Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Energy Institute webinar, uh, Hydrogen in the New Era for Clean Energy. Uh, my name is Daniel Deveza. I work as an analyst for the Energy Institute's Knowledge Service. Uh, I was also the project lead for the development of the EI's Guide to Hydrogen. Uh, so for those of you who might not know, uh, the Energy Institute is an independent network of professionals spanning the whole energy system. Uh, convening and facilitating debate, we bring together expertise so that energy could be better understood, managed and valued. Uh, now, I mentioned the EI's Guide to Hydrogen. Uh, this was produced uh, in order to help move the conversation about hydrogen from the lab into the living room. It's written for everyday energy consumers rather than technical experts. The guide helps to increase awareness and inform discussion about how hydrogen might be deployed in the low carbon energy system. Uh, it sets out what hydrogen is, how it's made, transported and used. Uh, what would the experience of using it be like in the home or for transport? or an industry, uh, where well, you can find out more about the guide uh, by visiting our website. Uh, if you go to www.energy-inst.org forward, forward slash hydrogen, uh, you'll find the guide there uh, available for free. Uh, and I do encourage you to go take a look. So today uh, we will be hearing from uh, three excellent speakers. Uh, the running order is that they will each initially uh, talk for between 15 and 20 minutes. Uh, this will then be followed by a Q&A session uh, and there will be a chance for them to give their closing remarks as well. Now, this webinar is uh, part of the lead up to the Powering Net Zero conference. Uh, this is a new conference from the Energy Institute. Uh, it's designed to discuss ways in which clean electricity and electrification will be essential uh, in reducing emissions globally to net zero. Now, this conference will be held online on the 6th of October. If you go to our website now, you can have a look at the program and register. I'd now like to thank uh, our sponsors. We have uh, IBM, who is the Energy Institute's knowledge partner. Uh, I'd also like to thank Accenture and EDF Renewables, who are sponsoring this webinar. So attendees, you probably have uh, realized that uh, you're not able to switch on your cameras or microphones in the main session. Uh, and to improve sound quality, we'd also recommend that you be using headphones. Now, this webinar is not uh, being held under Chatham House rules. It is being recorded and uh, we will send out a link to everyone afterwards, as well as uh, a copy of the slides used in the webinar by the presenters. Uh, and that recording will also be available on our website and our YouTube page in the days to come. However, of course, we do want your participation. Uh, so during the webinar, you'll be able to submit any questions you have to the speakers. Um, and you can start uh, submitting them right uh, right away. You don't need to wait until the Q&A. You just need to go to the chat box, which is in the, the bottom right corner, uh, and select all panelists uh, from the drop down list and, and just type your question there. And we'll try and get through as many as we can uh, later on. Uh, just to give a bit of context around uh, around hydrogen. So hydrogen is obviously a, it's a hot topic. There's a lot of excitement around it at the moment. Uh, and for good reason, it has a big potential in helping us to reach net zero. Uh, it can be used in lots of different applications, uh, like fueling vehicles, heating buildings, uh, for seasonal storage on the electricity grid, or uh, perhaps for powering hard to abate industrial processes. Uh, it produces zero emissions at the point of use, and it can be made from low carbon electricity. However, there are of course big challenges to uh, scaling up the production of hydrogen. Uh, and that's something that will be needed to reduce costs and improve economies of scale. Uh, only a tiny fraction of the hydrogen made today is low carbon, and that's going to have to change. And expanding hydrogen's reach to new applications will uh, be quite difficult. Um, so uh, without further ado, we will uh, move on uh, to our speakers who will be able to give you, of course, more information on this. Uh, and so our first speaker today is Kristen Panarali. Kristen is the Head of Electricity Industry at the World Economic Forum, and she'll be talking about uh, the path to net zero, industrial clusters and hydrogen. Uh, so over to you, Kristen. On the next slide, we're going to take a step back to look at the big picture. So this is the path to a net zero carbon future. And I find this I find this picture a really helpful framework to show the solution. And hydrogen is just one of several solutions. 
These are the solutions that are pushing markets forward towards the net zero carbon future. So in this path, markets are moving from addressing the foundational elements of the electricity sector past pivot points in the middle where there's a higher level of variable renewables all the way to a net zero integrated energy system. Now, most markets are currently in the far left in that first phase, and they're centered on no regret solutions like efficiency improvement, expanding renewables like solar and wind, and enhancing grid and interconnection. Now, the center ring is what we call the transformational phase. And this is when the annual electricity generation mix is hitting 20 to 30% variable renewables. And this is where Europe is sitting. And, and here is where the system is going to require much more emphasis on power market redesign. And the far right side, this is when the energy system becomes much more integrated in order to achieve a net zero future. So it's important to note that, that, that throughout this path, there is a continued focus on efficiency, on adding renewables and upgrading the grid, because these are the core elements that help us get to that final destination, which is highly electric, but it's going to go beyond just electrification and include hydrogen and CO2 solutions. None of this is going to be possible without significant digitalization and much more collaboration across the system. So my message here is just that hydrogen doesn't stand on its own two feet. It needs to be seen in the context of this path and the wider transition. So we're going to move on to talk about energy consumption by industry. The focus of my, my, my talk is about industrial clusters, and every industrial cluster in the world is unique. They're all going to have different geography, different energy costs, existing infrastructure, and industry composition. So they're going to be a mix of, of heavy industry, like iron and steel, and light industry, like food. So on this list, all of those in red are those with light to medium processes, and those in black are harder to evade. And there's two points to highlight here. First of all, see all of that blue and aqua in there? That is what's already electrified. And so the end goal is to ensure that it's backed by clean power. And the other point that is often lost in all of the noise is that about 50% of industrial emissions come from light industry that are less energy intensive. So on our next slide, we have a framework with a menu of abatement solutions that address both light and heavy industry. So my second point is that a range of solutions is needed. So we're gonna focus on the top half of this menu. What all industrial clusters have in common is that they can implement the top half of solutions. Systemic efficiency. This has the potential to reduce emissions by 15%. It's the most underutilized abatement solution. Now, there's been significant progress in efficiency. 40 billion has been invested globally in industrial efficiency mainly in China and North America. But much more can be done at a cluster level to increase circularity, to share resources, to create cross-industry collaborations, to utilize waste heat, and to evaluate other waste streams to identify what could be valuable inputs for counterparts. Now, continuing in this top half of solutions, direct electrification and renewable heat. Like systemic efficiency, if played right, can result in 15% reduction in emission. Good. Now, direct electrification has not been widely implemented because of the high cost of electricity relative to natural gas. Right. You might find this interesting too. Yeah. 
and because stranded investment um, in fossil-based assets. <laughs> but many factors have been evolving that's changing this, and that's carbon pricing, cheaper renewables, shared infrastructure such as microgrids, and better technologies like new heat pumps. Now, we're gonna look at the bottom half now, hydrogen and CCUS. These play a role where efficiency doesn't reach and where electrification will not work. The barrier to, to, to green hydrogen is, is that it's costly and we want it to be less costly to the alternatives. And this is where industrial clusters and demand center can really make a big difference because there's already a demand for gray hydrogen in these places. And there's an opportunity to convert this to green. And there's also a need because of the high emission. So when production and consumption are in the same geographical space, an internal market for green hydrogen can be created. And there's no need to make large investments in long distance infrastructure or storage. So it's that efficiency of the co-location that's going to be the driver to reduce the cost of green hydrogen. Now, just to wrap up this slide, I just wanna emphasize that all of these solutions are needed and we should really be aiming for as much efficiency and electrification as possible because these solutions can be implemented now and in most cases are going to win on economics alone. But in a demand center, the co-location of energy supply and demand can be used to drive down the cost of all of these technologies and especially green hydrogen. So I'm gonna share with you two case studies to help illustrate. So the next slide, please, um, thanks. So this first one is a commercial model with solar and where the hydrogen supply and demand are co-located. So Iberdrola launched what will be the largest plant producing green hydrogen in 2021. And the strategy is to replace the gray hydrogen with green. So Iberdrola will be supplying the solar PV electricity and the fertilizer company is going to modify its plant to use green hydrogen to manufacture the fertilizer. Thus, they're going to reduce the usage of natural gas and reduce emissions at the same time. And this is the start of a multi-year strategy where they will continue to build on this hydrogen footprint in the area. Now, the next slide shows a second example of a commercial model, but this time with wind. So the Gigastack Consortium is made up of three partners. First of all, Orsted, who is going to build and operate the offshore wind farm. ITM Power, who will produce the green hydrogen. And Philips 66, who will utilize the renewable hydrogen to reduce the refinery emission. So they're going to start with a five megawatt electrolyzer, but they aim to scale this to the gigawatt size in order to reduce costs. Now I'm sharing this example because the consortium also aims to develop a replicable model. And it, that model will be based on the regulatory and the commercial and the technical challenges of this project. So on the next slide, please. These, these two examples, I'm sharing them because they highlight putting into practice the elements of a sustainable business model. So the bigger picture, the goal is to get to a net zero carbon future. And we see that there are four levers to do that. First of all, technology. And the technology is available. It, it is about scaling and creating coordinated approaches to deployment. But beyond that, there are other elements. And this includes coordinated policies that take into account efficiency, electrification, and hydrogen, and partnerships across business and government. And finally, the right financing at the right time. Next slide, please. So I'm going to leave you with this quote, 
And I'm going to summarize my three points once again. First, leverage demand centers. Second, there is a path of solutions and hydrogen is just one point of the story. And my final point on hydrogen is that there are emerging commercial models paving the way and showing that we can design now with green hydrogen as the end game. I thank you for your time and I invite you to take a look at the recent report that was launched by Accenture in collaboration with the World Economic Forum on industrial clusters. I uh, will be sending around my slide deck and there will be a link to that report there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kristen, for that introduction uh, to the webinar. And um, it does sound as though you're saying we, we do have the technology, which is very encouraging and it just needs scaling up. And it, I liked what you said about how these industrial clusters can kind of be like a, almost a testing ground, like a playground for uh, for hydrogen in a kind of smaller scale. And perhaps this can lead then uh, once things are more established to, to using it elsewhere outside of these industrial clusters as well. OK, um, just a reminder before we move on that you can uh, leave your questions in the chat box at any time and we'll get back to them later. Uh, just need to address it in the chat box to all panelists. Uh, great, okay. Well, we'll now move on uh, to our next speaker who is Steve Hargreaves. Uh, Steve is the Strategy, Sustainability and Energy Systems Director at EDF. And he will be talking about the fundamental differences between green and blue hydrogen. You may have heard Kristen there mention, um, she mentioned gray and, and green hydrogen, the, the different colors used to describe uh, the way that it's made, as I'm sure he'll get into now. Uh, so looking forward to uh, your talk, Steve. Great, thanks, Daniel. Um, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Yeah, all good, yeah. Good, thank you. Um, and thanks uh, to the Energy Institute for this invitation um, to, to talk a bit on hydrogen. Um, as Daniel said, I, I have responsibility in EDF for strategy and for sustainability and for energy system economics. Um, so I, I can certainly not claim to be a subject matter expert on hydrogen per se, but I, I do spend an awful lot of my time um, with my teams thinking about modeling of future energy systems and, and, and how on earth we'll get our whole economy to net zero. Um, and that's uh, that's how I've got very, very interested in hydrogen because um, yeah, I'm pretty convinced that, that hydrogen will play a... Um, a major and an important role in, in, in the net zero economy. Um, exactly how big is, is a big uncertainty, but in any world, it's going to be a lot bigger than anything today. Um, and it, yeah, when, when I look at the analysis, which I've seen, it's, it's anything between 10 and, and 30 times the size of UK's current hydrogen market. Um, and even that is not a, a, you know, a, a good comparison. Um, Cause I, as Daniel said earlier, the, the the vast majority of the current market is is, is kind of so-called grey hydrogen, so that in itself is heavily carbon polluting. Um, so we've got to get our hydrogen production to to to, to um, we need a, a yeah, revolution really to to produce um, a low carbon hydrogen economy. Um, so anyway, in, to, today in my talk, I'm I'm just going to do a little bit on production and uses of of hydrogen, um, a bit on the pros and cons of of blue versus green hydrogen. Um, and then a little bit on the role of hydrogen across different energy systems. And, and Kristen talked, um, touched on all of those points as well in a, um, dare I say, it's a much more articulate way than, than I'm going to do. But um, um, so anyway, if I could have my first slide, please. Um, so this is a hugely simplified view of the supply and demand possibilities for hydrogen in a net zero economy. Um, so on the supply side, um, essentially two, accepted methods of producing low carbon hydrogen, um, yeah, which people talk about as blue or green. Um, so blue, which is 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 the, the one at the bottom left of the, of, of the picture, um, essentially it very simply just splits methane um, in a process which um, then forms hydrogen and carbon dioxide as, as a byproduct. Um, green actually takes water as its feedstock and um, then uses uh, low carbon electricity from renewables or, or, or nuclear 
um, in a process of electrolysis to split the water into hydrogen with oxygen as a byproduct. Um, so blue is is most like the ex the established grey production of, of hydrogen. Um, yeah, um, the, the only big difference is um, to make it blue, you actually have to capture and then either use or store the carbon dioxide um, to, uh, uh, to 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 make it low carbon. Um, so, so that's kind of a very, very simple on the production side. On on the supply side, um, yeah. So, so there are some, um, yeah, big opportunities. Um, yeah, in terms of in terms of reaching the parts of the economy that um, um, electricity can't. I think Kristen said said the same thing. Um, you know, going beyond electricity, and that's where carbon seems to, sorry, um, hydrogen seems to have its its, its competitive advantage. Um, yeah, so, so very, very simple terms, you know, the, the, the role of hydrogen in, in the economy, likely to be heavily used in, in helping finish the decarbonisation of, of, of industry, um, decarbonisation of, of heavy transport. Um, it will play a role in the power system, I'm absolutely certain, in squeezing the last few grams per kilowatt hour out of the electricity system um, and also potentially um, the decarbonization of, of, of heat. Um, but and in, in this way of, of, of sort of thinking that, that, that hydrogen is, is kind of in, in the more difficult areas of, of decarbonization, it, it, it's, it's quite important that we don't think um, we can just leave it to, 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 the, to the last minute to, 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 to develop the hydrogen economy because there is a massive um, amount of work needed to actually get the uh, get the, get the thing going. Um, you know, so actually, action is needed now. Even if um, the big growth is probably going to be coming in 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 the thirties and forties. Um, so, if I could go on to my next slide, please. Um, so again, this this was something I was asked to cover really, which was the um, the. Um, pros and cons of um, green versus blue hydrogen. In, in many ways, I, at this stage, I, I often feel like this is, is probably the wrong question. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're, we're kind of nowhere um, in terms of developing the, the, the scale of low carbon hydrogen that we need. Um, so for me, what that means, what, what, what that feels like is we're going to need both blue hydrogen and green hydrogen to get the um, hydrogen economy moving. And, and both of these technologies represent a, a massive improvement on grey hydrogen. Um, so, um, I, to me, I think they've both got um, a role and um, and a huge value in enabling enabling the future. Um, but that said, um, I guess if we do force ourselves to look at, at some of the pros and cons, um, the big challenge for blue hydrogen um, is essentially the, the residual CO2 emissions. And, and these actually come in two parts. You can see on the picture on the right hand side of the graph. Um, yeah, the, the one which everybody always counts um, are kind of the, the, the back end um, CO2 emissions. Um, um, yeah, carbon capture solutions aren't 100 percent efficient. Um, yeah, so we expect things to be um, these things to probably um, capture 90, 95 percent of the carbon. But there'll be some residual carbon emissions, which which are shown in that little yellow blob on the right hand side. Um, and people generally in their analysis tend to always count that and, and take account of that. Um, the bit that is often ignored is actually the front end of the process. So the upstream greenhouse gas emissions associated with the extraction and transport of, of, of the gas. So this is things like methane leakage. It's the energy consumed in, in, in transport or in LNG processes. Um, and these can be quite big, these emissions. So, so you're probably smallest if you take North Sea. Um, gas, you know, with the smallest distances and, and, and no liquef liquef liquefaction. Um, but if you've got long pipelines from Russia or LNG from Qatar, then then you, you can get the, the sort of like, um, you know, you know the, the, the scale of, of carbon emissions that you see on the picture. Um, and this probably means that, yeah, blue hydrogen is more of a transitional technology rather than one that's compatible finally with net zero. But the transition is going to be three decades, so hence my first point. You know, I, I think as yeah, Kristen said that the um, green hydrogen is the end game, um, but there's a lot of games to play on 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 the way. Um, so, um, um, 
if you set against that and then and then look at um, um, you know, some of the things about about green hydrogen. So some of the, some of the things about that, I mean, I suppose, first, you absolutely need a low carbon um, electricity supply. So 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 in UK, if you connected it to the grid at the moment with grid um, um, levels of, of carbon intensity, you wouldn't get a great carbon answer. Um, yeah, but so you actually need to connect it directly to renewables or to nuclear. Um, to, to, to get a low carbon um, answer. Yeah, in France, it's a bit different because um, France grid is, is, is already largely decarbonized. So you, so you get a different answer in France. And, and then the other thing, and I think Kristen mentioned this, is, is the cost. So electrolyzers are currently pretty expensive. Um, so we need um, those to scale up and we need economies of scale and learning effect and all that sort of stuff. And there's no reason to think that the cost of those electrolyzers won't come down. Um, but we do need to 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 see that, um, and and the other big cost elements aside from the um, the capital cost of the electrolyzer is actually the cost of the electricity putting it in, um, and that's where optimizing the production of hydrogen in the context of other markets becomes very very important, um, which brings me to my final slide, um, which is a little bit of a conversation about. Um, talking about hydrogen right across the whole uh, energy system. Um, yeah, and, and Kristen talked about this um, a, yeah, in a very nice way, um, about the importance of integrating across the different systems and also integrating with demand. Um, and that's what we're thinking out, um, uh, think, thinking about a, quite a lot at the moment. If, if you look at some of the amazing whole system modeling, which is done by the likes of Energy System Catapult or Imperial College, you, 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 you'll find that the, the optimum answer is, is generally a lot better if, if the energy system as a whole is modeled rather than just taking the different bits by themselves. Um, and if you try and sort of understand why that, 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 there's a very sort of simplistic way of thinking about it, which is thinking that electricity is going to be a major pillar, pillar of the economy um, and electricity is going to be supplied in the main by offshore wind. Um, with a little bit of solar, a little bit of nuclear, a little bit of gas CCS or biomass. Bio um, but the massive challenge and, you know, amongst many of the net zero electricity challenges is, is, is how you deal with um, yeah, the overproduction you get when it's um, extremely windy and um, meeting demand when it's not extremely windy. And, and this, this makes hydrogen a, a sort of great candidate to get, to, get, to get a good share of the action because it basically hydrogen has got the potential to be um, stored cheaply. So, you know, you can have a process, an electro electrolyzer process where you can produce hydrogen for quite a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, particularly when there's good wind output across the, um, the country. Um, but then you can interrupt the hydrogen production if, if you become a bit short of power and maybe even generate power with hydrogen using hydrogen turbines if you, for, for the times of, of, of real shortage. And then um, there are benefits here in, in co-locating and particularly in the short term. So again, Kristen showed some great examples of the clusters from, um, um, from, from the work up in the north of England. Um, we're looking at one um, around, around Sizewell. Um, yeah, Sizewell is a great location in some respects. It's, it, it's, it's a landing point for lots of offshore wind um, and, and continental power interconnection. Um, the, 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 the gas network at Backton is very close by. Um, we've got two major ports, uh, Felixstone Harwich nearby. And the idea here is that we can create a, a, an, an energy cluster or an energy hub um, where you can use the benefits of um, the heat and hydrogen and electricity, optimizing them in real time to get the to 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 to, to meet the needs of, of of the different customers and and and, and the value. So um, we're exploring that at, at, at Sizewell at the moment. Um, we're working um, um, with uh, Freeport East Hydrogen Hub. So that's that's led by um, um, uh, Hutchison um, Ports, um, you know, one of the world's biggest port operators. Got the great thing there is you've got the real demand of the the the, the, uh, the, the ships and the trains that feed it, and um, potentially we've also got a massive construction site at Sizewell C where we'll be able to use hydrogen buses for workers and hydrogen JCBs and and all that sort of stuff. So um, quite an ex ex exciting example of of this idea of of optimizing across the system. Um, so if I was to summarize what I what, 
what I was trying to say. So firstly, hydrogen is going to be, um, the way I put it, is either very important or very, very important in, in the net zero economy. Um, we've got a massive distance to travel to, to get it really, truly es es established. So let's not too, be too sniffy about blue and green and, and all that sort of stuff. Both, both represent um, big steps forward. Um, but long term, we have to take account of the residual emissions in blue. And then finally, think cross system. Um, that's really going to improve the role of, uh, and, and the economics of hydrogen in the long term. Hope that was clear enough. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Um, so, oh, I don't go just yet because we've got a couple of questions for you. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, if we could actually uh, just go back a slide. Um, so we just had a question about maybe the uh, the y axis on the graph there. So uh, that's uh, could you just explain what what that that metric is basically? That's uh, uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's the grams CO2 equivalent. Um, it, so. it is, yeah, yeah. It's, it's being ele electrical people, we tend to put these things unhelpfully in kilowatt hours rather than in in kilograms that most people do. So, but it's 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 um, grams of CO2 equivalent um, per kilowatt hour of electricity produced. Um, so, um, what what you see is the the, the, the direct emissions from um, um, a steam methane reformer plus CCS is around twenty five, um, but then depending on the source of your methane, you can be up to you know, 45 or right up to 120 if you're, if you're bringing in, um, I think the highest ones are sort of like um, LNG um, from, from you know, yeah, because there's quite a lot of energy used in the LNG process. Um, whereas electricity, yeah, electrolysis, if you have zero carbon electricity um, is going in, there's no direct emissions, but there are indirect emissions associated with the, um, 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 the, the life cycle emissions of your nuclear power station or your wind turbine. Okay, great. I um, also have a question, uh, actually, while we're on this slide as well, uh, from uh, Diana Leo saying, uh, in terms of the different colours of hydrogen, is there a different in difference in how efficient they are, as in if you take one unit of gas or one unit of electricity, uh, how much does it take to, to produce the uh, one unit of hydrogen? Because that's often something that's leveled at, at hydrogen is, um, you know, it can sometimes, it can be less efficient uh, perhaps than an electrification. So I don't know if uh, if that's something you'd be able to talk about, um, but yeah. Um. Yeah, so um, I mean, I, mean I, I believe that the efficiency of, of electrolysis is pretty high. I can't read all the numbers off. Um, um, where, where you would lose out um, is if you um, then want to turn the um, that, that hydrogen back into electricity, um, because yeah, yeah, the, the best um, combined cycle gas turbines are, are at sort of 50, 60 percent efficiency. Um, and in, in all truth, if you were to have hydrogen as, as peaking plants in the power system, you'd probably um, wouldn't have even even combined cycle. You probably have um, simple cycle. Um, so you're probably down at 30, 40 percent efficiency. Um, so the round trip um, storage efficiency of hydrogen is, um, it, you know, is relatively low. Now, what's funny is that doesn't kill the economics, because actually, if you look at the you know, electricity system, um, essentially, once, once you're down to nearly zero carbon electricity system, where we're rightly decarbonizing with yeah, um, mainly wind in the UK, um, you know, cu coupled with some other stuff, you have an awful lot of um, waste, power, actually. Okay. Uh, and finding a use of that waste power is, is fantastic. And, and if, if the power is otherwise going to go to waste, then the efficiency is less of an issue. Not, yeah. so, not important, but um, um, yeah, I, I, I honestly don't know how to compare with the methane splitting. I don't, I, I don't know what metric I'd use for that. So, yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, and um, we'll, I'm sure we'll come back to some more of that in the, in the Q&A later. So right. thanks, thanks, Steve. Uh, and encouraging as well to note uh, what you said about uh, perhaps at the moment it's not green versus blue. It's uh, we need everything. And I think Kristen was saying that as well. We need we need all of these different technologies in order to reach net zero. So, uh, okay, great. So uh, finally, uh, we will 
go to uh, Helen McComb, our next speaker. Uh, so Helen is the head of hydrogen theme at the Department for Bayes. That's uh, business energy and industrial strategy here in the UK. And she's in the uh, SICE uh, directorate, which is science and innovation for, for climate and energy. And as you can see from the slide, she'll be talking about hydrogen's role in homes. Uh, so over to you, Helen. Thanks, Daniel. Can you hear me well enough? You give me a thumbs up. Perfect. So hello, I'm Helen. Nice to meet you all. Um, as Daniel said, I work in a uh, kind of uh, technical area in Bayes, um, where I work on innovation programmes specifically. And I'm here to talk to you today about some work that we've been doing um, on a programme called High for Heat, which is about um, the potential for using hydrogen in the home. So if I can have probably the next slide, please. So I want to, first of all, try and situate High for Heat within a bit of a bigger picture of kind of policy and context. Um, as I understand it, there's been a few kind of waves of hype and interest around hydrogen power over the decades, um, but the interest in using it in the homes is actually relatively new. Um, what we we think of the birth of, of getting involved in this uh, ourselves in our area is um, there was some public reports in 2016, um, which kind of argued quite strongly for hydrogen for home heating being an attractive option. Um, I've got some quotes here. And in the wake of those reports, um, a colleague of mine in, in my directorate made the case internally for us doing some systematic technical work to try and um, establish a kind of solid evidence base about the, the feasibility of domestic hydrogen use. Um, and that led to our um, High for Heat programme getting set up and running. So we, we spent 2017 kind of making the case to spend some money on this. Um, and we got, kind of got up and running late 2017 into 2018. Um, with our programme. If I could just grab the next slide, please. Um, we've got a mission statement for our programme um, to establish if it's technically possible, safe and convenient to replace methane with hydrogen um, in domestic buildings. Um, partly because when we started getting into this, there were some quite basic technical questions that we felt hadn't been kind of ad adequately answered or considered. So we wanted to just um, do some innovation work and, and just kind of see how things checked out for making use of hydrogen um, before everybody got carried away um, with kind of grand, grand visions. So we went ahead and we did our programme. Um, in process, I'll come on to the findings in a sec. In process terms, it's involved um, a consortium um, of businesses working with us. And we've got um, what's called ARIT Plus as a kind of program management contractor who brings things together. We've got about 40 contracts in below that. So we've got quite a lot of people um, working with us on High for Heat. In fact, I think there's a diagram to come, so you'll get to see some of them. Um, and what we do in High for Heat is focused on hydrogen use, hydrogen for home use, but upstream of the meter. There's a kind of sister project um, that's being run by gas distribution networks, um, looking at kind of issues for putting hydrogen through the gas network. Um, which kind of links into our one. So there we are. Here we are. We're doing the high for heat program. We're looking at some basic technical questions. Um, and that's kind of my context um, sat within a UK policy context of wanting to explore the potential of hydrogen in quite a systematic, sensible way. Um, I thought it might be interesting to talk about what's going on internationally on domestic hydrogen, um, but I'm not vastly aware of huge swathes of work. If anybody in the audience is, I'd be delighted to hear about it. Um, I know that in the Netherlands, they've got a kind of demonstration home site um, where they use hydrogen heating, but they're using it through a kind of district heating network system. So it's a wee bit different to what we're doing. Um, we're kind of testing the potential for running it through the gas grid. Um, I understand the Swedes may have a hydrogen demonstration house as well. Um, one of the last parts of info I'll get through the high for heat program myself will be a kind of international literature review, but we haven't we haven't got that yet. So I've only got a kind of impressionistic view of what's going on elsewhere. Um, I can say that I believe the work we've done on um, technical standards has been picked up quite a lot internationally. So there seems to be you know, a degree of interest in, in this as a potential option, um, but I'm not aware of anybody being vastly further ahead. Um, also, in terms of the big picture, um, can talk about this a little bit in Q&A if you want, um, but 
it's worth saying that compared to when we started um, a few years back, there's now a kind of increased policy interest in hydrogen. Um, although our high for heat programme is kind of moving to a close now, it's likely that from, from my innovation director, we'll do a bit more in this space. Um, but we also have a kind of policy team in Bayes who are the, the hydrogen heating team um, and are thinking about policy in that area. Uh, you know, and as you would expect, we've also got a hydrogen economy team um, looking at hydrogen for kind of clusters and so on. So there's a bunch of policy work going on in around this space. Um, and in fact, the Prime Minister's 10 point plan of last autumn um, for a green industrial revolution um, makes hydrogen one of its 10 points. It's kind of one of the, the key um, areas of work that we're going to be pursuing in the UK in terms of net zero. So it, it kind of all fits into to some of that wider strategy. Um, but what I'm going to talk about you now is the technical programme and the kind of nuts and bolts of what we've what we've built. So let's go on. Let's have another slide. There you go. So the high for heat programme. Um, one of the key things we've done is um, look at whether it's possible to make domestic appliances that run on hydrogen. Um, when we started out with the programme, we weren't really sure if a domestic hydrogen boiler or cooker would be viable. Um, now, at the stage we're at now, I don't yet have the kind of final, final insight reports through, but based on the progress we're seeing through milestones, um, what I can say is I'm pretty confident that hydrogen appliances can work well um, and kind of safely. And it's also looking, um, although the costs might not be too, too far away from those of natural gas appliances. So what we've been doing is, is sponsoring people to, to make prototype hydrogen appliances. Um, you've got a big list of them on the slides here. Um, we've got some, you know, some quite things that we get quite excited about on them. Um, we've found that you can get a decent flame picture with a hydrogen flame without adding colorant if you do the technology right. Um, we found out you can fit hydrogen technology into a kind of pretty standard boiler box you know, cooker box that you're used to. The most kind of important thing really is that the the notified bodies are testing against a quality and kind of safety standard and those tests seem to be coming through pretty well. Um, and so that's that's what, you know, one of the big things that we've been doing and working on big results for us. Um, and we've looked across, as you can see, quite a range of appliances, also meters, um, connectors, um, most of the things you would probably need um, and we're we're finding that there maybe are certain technical issues that need to get resolved but it doesn't seem impossible to do so um, one of the um, pieces of technology we're testing is a fuel cell I don't know if that's even mentioned there but um, that's interesting because it, it kind of checks out the prospects for the main having the kind of main technology you would need to operate a hybrid um, a hydrogen heat pump so it seems that, you know, hydrogen appliances are, are going to be workable. Um, it's been great to work on the, this bit of the programme with a lot of manufacturers, including some SMEs across the UK. Uh, we're now at the stage of displaying our kit. So we've got a hydrogen boiler installed at a place called High Street, which is up at the DNVGL site um, up in Cumbria. And shortly, um, a fixed kind of publicly accessible centre, demonstration centre will open um, at Low Thornley near Gateshead. There's a wee screenshot there showing you the building the modular house. Um, similarly, we're hoping to display some of our hydrogen appliances at COP um, in Glasgow to kind of make the point that hydrogen appliances are, are a pretty tangible um, future heat solution that you can, you could cook your mince and potatoes on them today if you could get the hydrogen, um, you know, if you could put the cooker in your house. but it is there, it does work. Um, so that's been good. Um, interesting on the appliance side as well, we've we've seen that it's possible with domestic boilers to make them as hydrogen ready appliances. Um, so that means you can put a boiler in your house and you can, if you set it up in the right way, you can potentially switch it to work, to, you know, to switch it from using natural gas to in the future using hydrogen with a relatively simple um, conversion kit and a relatively short engineer visit. So that's something that sparked quite a lot of interest in the um, in the industry. Um, and they've been subsequently quite active in talking about their interests in this. Um, and it's obviously something that's quite interesting in terms of thinking about transitions. So 
there you go that's my slide on our appliances and, and into, just to sum up you know we don't see that many reasons really why switching would would require much difference in terms of appliances than, than what we've got now so can i have my next slide please that's the slide I promised. These are some of the 40 odd contracts and people that are working with us on high for heat. Um, you can see Worc Worcester Bosch and Baxi, the big boiler boys. We've got two domestic boilers, um, sets of domestic boilers being looked at and, and a range of other um, appliance makers are also involved. Um, next slide. That's just a quick one. Right. So the third big thing I want to talk about, and I'm run out of time yeah um other things we've been doing um are kind of system related outputs so we've supported technical research and work on technical standards um to kind of provide us with some solid information and working assumptions about how a domestic system using hydrogen could operate so as a result of what we've been doing we've kind of concluded that the current odorant used for gas would be viable um that you probably don't need colorant um on the grounds of in-home use. Um, it might be something the upstream networks feel is useful, but it doesn't seem to be necessary um, in terms of flame visibility. Um, we've got to having a um, BSI does a public acceptable standard, um, no on kind of safety of hydrogen appliances, and that's something we've used to, to test our prototypes against. Um, so we've been doing quite a range of things about what you might need to think about for a hydrogen system I've done some stuff working um as well kind of in, training for installers and what we needed in that space so we've done quite a range of things within the program um and that's the main thing i would want to say about that really um can i have my next slide please um, i'm not gonna do this i haven't got enough time we've done some safety work um, and that will be coming out shortly next slide thank you um fab so what would I say overall about hydrogen um, domestically? Um, I suppose I would say that the results of the high for heat program have moved us quite a bit further forward towards being able to um, practically trial hydrogen for heating in homes. Um, and that's good because the 10 point plan, that, uh, the PM 10 point plan that I mentioned um, sets out that kind of ambitious vision to go forward and do testing um, along the lines of the, the kind of quotes I've got here. So local neighbourhood trials start from 2023 and then kind of scaling up. Um, and that's what's being worked on at the moment in the UK. Um, as I've said, we've got appliances prototypes quite well advanced um, and we're going to be demonstrating those um, in the low Thornley fixed site and also in COP um, to kind of make people aware of, of what's possible in this space. Um, and beyond that, the kind of next steps in our program, we'll be looking at innovation and across the rest of Bayes, um, there's a range of, of plans um, in terms of thinking about potential for hydrogen. Um, the next thing that you might be able to watch out for if you're interested is a hydrogen strategy, which is due to come out um, probably June, late June time. Um, and if you're interested to kind of watch for that, and it'll give you a sense of what government's up to, um, both on domestic use and in the kind of wider sense. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, just to say, we are running slightly ahead of time. So if you do want to talk through your, your other slides, you're, you're welcome to as well. Um, but uh, otherwise, I can, okay, no problem. Um, just sticking with you for, for a second. So um, we could actually go back to a couple of slides. Um, uh, yes, that, that's the one, thank you. So um, got a question about odorants, um, which is that, so we have here that hydrogen can utilize the same odorant as natural gas. Uh, we do have a question about um, are there odorants that could work okay if hydrogen is used in fuel cells? Because I do know that fuel cells tend to need very pure hydrogen. Uh, I don't know, is that something that, that you've looked into? I can speculate. Um, I'm not an absolute expert on this, but my understanding is that, um, so odorant is something that you, you mix into the hydrogen when you're putting it in the gas grid primarily, and you're putting it in there so that if it escapes from a a big bore pipe or if it escapes in the home people smell gas and they take protective action so that's what we're doing with with odrin essentially um so obviously as you say um there's an interesting question about odrin in terms of what people might want to do with the hydrogen when they get it out of the pipe 
um, if they get it off the gas grid, can they use a fuel cell? Um, my understanding is that if you want to use it in a fuel cell, you'll need to have a purification process virtually regardless. If you've got it through a pipe, you'll need to purify it before you can put it in a fuel cell because you pick up wee bits of dust and stuff from getting it through a pipe. So I don't, it's probably still to be kind of determined about what's sensible in terms of odorant from the upstream point of view. Um, what we've been really testing for is the kind of downstream, you know, point of view. If you, can people smell it? If it escapes in your house, does using the blend that we've got, is it okay for the kind of domestic purpose? And, and we think it is. I think, you know, there's probably still questions to think about in terms of what would be sensible if we're using it in a system. Um, but I don't think, I don't know, I think it's it's yet to be determined the fuel cells thing. And because the fact is that fuel cells almost certainly need to purify anyway, I would kind of hope that they'll be able to figure out a solution about, you know, if you get the dust out, you get the odor out as well. Um, great. Okay. And just one more question for you, Helen, while, while we've got you is, um, so we've got a question about uh, Towns gas. So for, for those who don't know, um, in the UK, before we used uh, natural gas, mainly methane, we used Towns gas, which was a mix of yeah. different gases, but included a substantial amount of hydrogen. Um, so about 50% hydrogen, yeah, 50% kind of methane. It, it, I, I believe exactly. something like that, yeah. Exactly. So so the question that we've got is that um, having had this in the gas network previously, is it not already proven uh, uh, we can do this and we can run homes on a substantial amount of hydrogen. Uh, is the need for this research work, is that because you're looking uh, all the way to 100% hydrogen or is it just it's important to check with the, the appliances we have today? Um, what, what's the, important the, the thinking of, behind it? Yeah, I guess I think it's just important to um, to kind of refresh and firm up your evidence base before you get to the point of potentially taking you know ex important expensive policy decisions so it's true that the uk used towns gas up to I think about the 50s um but obviously our understanding of safety issues and kind of risk management and all sorts of things has improved quite a bit since the 50s so you know i think although we have you know although we have the sense and we had the kind of proposition that i mentioned in the 2016 reports that oh it'd all be fine um you know we, we still felt it was sensible to to do some systematic kind of thinking about, um, you know, the issues on the basis of today's best knowledge um, and to kind of check things out. So I don't really speak about officially at all, um, in fact, and I shouldn't, the upstream side of things, but as I say, there's an upstream kind of sister program kind of related to high heat, which is about what would be involved in running hydrogen um, through the gas network. And obviously, you know, this stuff about colour and odorant, they've been looking at it from their perspective as well. Um, and I think, I think, and don't, you, you know, check out yourself or take your own due diligence, but, you know, the, while we might have done it with Towns Gas, um, I think there are certainly pipeline issues to think about in terms of using hydrogen, because as I understand it, it can be, there's kind of some embrittlement issues for cast iron that can be involved. So it, you know, it kind of is something to think about for sure. Great. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Uh, okay. So I think we'll bring, we'll bring everyone back in now for the Q and A. Uh, we've had lots of questions coming in. So thank you for that uh, and keep them coming. Uh, and I'll just wait until we've, we've got everyone back on the screen. Great. Okay. Um, so uh, we'll start out uh, with uh, a question, which is, uh, quite big picture, thinking about uh, how uh, this is going to play out in the in the decades to come. Um, Steve already talked about um, blue and green hydrogen a little bit, but do you think that blue hydrogen uh, is just transitional and a stepping stone, uh, and then eventually we'll just use green hydrogen, uh, seeing as they're very different processes in the way that you make them? Or should we be uh, throwing our efforts just into green hydrogen now? Or do you think we'll be using both for a long time to come? Um, so maybe we'll uh, we'll start with uh, Kristen on that one. Sure. Personally, I think that we should be focused on replacing gray with green. And this goes back to my narrative about leveraging demand centers right now. Um, if we do that, we don't need to be building out new infrastructure. And um, you know, start with starting with green, 
I think just it just makes a lot of sense because you're you're able to use these these demand centers in order to to leverage the existing infrastructure that you have there and you're not having to build out additional infrastructure in order to store CO2. So um, my, my personal view is that we should be focused on green, driving down the cost by, by scaling right now in demand centers because we're able to use the existing infrastructure and replace gray, gray with green. Okay. Um, in the, in that case, what 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 uh, what do the other panelists think? Should we just be focusing on green uh, and leaving blue out of the equation? No. And to, to me, this is quite 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 amusing for the, that I'm going to be the person arguing that we should also be doing blue because um, EDF is uh, is an electricity company through and through, and yeah, our focus will most definitely be on green. Um, so yeah, but be, being yeah, to, to me, I think. There is going to be a role for blue as well, and I I think particularly where CCS infrastructure is being developed for other purposes. Um, yeah, in the long run, I absolutely think we have to get to green. I I just think you know these, um, and and yeah, I very much agree with everything Kristen said about the the, the benefits of, of of green in the in the net zero economy. I just think the challenge of what we've got to do is just so enormous. But um, and and it, it's not just where we get to, but it's what we do on on route as well. So I I personally, um, yeah, I'm less less polarized between the two. But um, it's a funny position for me to have, I suppose. Mm, Helen, it sounds like um, certainly within the the UK, there the government is considering kind of both options. Yeah. So I'm not on the policy side. But um, even I have um, able to report that um, the UK considers it has a kind of twin track approach and is kind of pursuing and, and planning to support, as I understand it, both green and blue, um, you know, going ahead. There are some countries, I understand some of the EU focus has been quite heavily on green, but, but we're not, we're intended to support green and blue, I believe. Okay, great. Um, Steve, going back to your presentation, and you mentioned that there would be, um, potentially having some hydrogen on the site of Sizewell C. That's obviously a, a very large nuclear reactor that's planned. So is the idea that because you have a sort of almost constant uh, supply of electricity from a big reactor, uh, you could use the excess when the grid demand is low in order to, to make hydrogen and, and use it on site? Uh, are there any other kind of, I guess, um, cooperations between these different technologies or is, is that what it comes down to essentially yeah yeah so so the I, the, the great thing about a nuclear um site for hydrogen is is nuclear is um not just a big producer of electricity but it's an enormous producer of heat and actually when you look at the future of electrolysis actually some of the um high temperature electrolysis looks like it could produce hydrogen as a greater efficiency so if you could actually, yeah, so we're building in the, the possibility at size well just to tap out some heat uh, at a point in the turbine cycle, just not 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 loads, but just 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 a bit, so that we could actually um, use the electricity um, yeah, generated by the nuclear reactor, but also use the heat from the nuclear reactor to actually get a very efficient hydrogen production um, cycle. And then the the, the other benefits, um, I guess, at um, at size well is, is where it could um, send the hydrogen. Um, so you know that there, there is the, the possibility of putting it into the, um, the, the the national transmission system, the gas transmission system, uh, back to and that's fairly close by. But there is the demand centres ports, um, which could be potentially you know quite interesting. And 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 not only the the, the ports themselves, but also the then the, the you know the corridors up into 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 into, into um, um, in, into the middle of Britain. Um, but, you know, you could imagine, um, you, you know, the, the ports being very hydrogen intensive, so use it for chipping and, and all that sort of stuff. So, so um, it's very early stage at the moment, I've got to say. Um, and the other point on, on, on size, well, I just, I just noticed in the, um, in the chat, so, um, uh, someone mentioned the, um, some opposition to size well as well. And, and, and I think, you yeah, know, important just to address that too, you know, and, and yeah, quite rightly that, that there is a, process of consultation um if you're going to you know, build something uh, you know this, this large infrastructure and um yeah the, the the dco 
process is designed explicitly to to to, to allow um, um, yeah discussion and opposition of the various merits of of of, of, of building the infrastructure, um, and um, I mean I, I guess a couple of points um, just to mention is is you know certainly what we're doing at Hinkley, which is as we'll see, will be a copy of copy point C. Um, yeah, yeah, it generally goes down reasonably well in the local community. There's a huge amount of jobs. There's a huge, you know, we make an awful lot of effort to use local supply chains for the catering, for the buses, for, yeah, all sorts of security. You know, we make a great attempt to use local labor. Um, and that, this is all set out in our socioeconomic reports. Um, we, 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 yeah, at Sizewell already, we do a huge amount to um, um, support biodiversity and protect the various species around. I think the other point just on nuclear is is, is when you consider land use per kilowatt hour produced, nuclear actually does really, really well compared to any um, um, other source. You know, it, it, it's a lot more, you know, like orders, several orders of magnitude um, better in terms of land use compared to to, to, to wind and, and and particularly compared to biomass, you know, the, the, the land associated with um, yeah, actually growing uh, wood to burn in power stations is enormous. So 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 um absolutely yeah respect the DCO process and everybody's um yeah 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 right to a point of view and um and, and it's a really important process and yeah thanks for the question. Great thank you. Uh got Daniel? a question here for yes. Daniel can I just jump in there and compliment what he said. I just I just wanted to comment that um Sizewell is is one of the examples in the report that I mentioned, the report that um, the World Economic Forum and Accenture recently launched. And it's just a it's a really great example of of um, of the industrial cluster ecosystem and leveraging it in order to create more efficiencies because they they have a bit of everything. They have a bit of all of the solutions that I was talking about, waste, heat, electrification, and hydrogen. So just to encourage everybody to, to take a look at the way that we frame it in the report as well. Thanks. That actually uh, leads on nicely to a question uh, someone had for you, Kristen, which is, Assuming that a cluster requires a kind of mixture of solutions, so efficiency, electrification, hydrogen, um, and you you were saying before that all these clusters are quite unique in the way that they're mixed between light and heavy industry. So, so how how do the companies or the clusters decide what to sort of invest in? Um, is what's the best way of figuring that out? One of the things that that comes out strongly in the work that we've been doing over the past year here at the World Economic Forum is this concept of system value. Um, in other words, what is the value to society, to the economy, and to the environment? And, and we, we like to, to use this, this lens to, to look at investment decisions, as well as decisions about policy or decisions about other business solutions, because if, if you're looking at what are your desired outcomes, the first step is 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 really to to think of it that way. Like, what what are you trying to achieve? Is it is it reducing emissions? Is it creating more jobs? Is it, um, you know, transforming the business in order to to meet certain policy requirements? And so the first step is really to to be looking at what are those outcomes, and then to make those decisions based on maximizing the system value of the transition and what are based on those most important outcomes. So, you know, it, it, it really depends on, on, you know, the particular market, it depends on the circumstances, but, but I would always go for, you know, what are the outcomes you're looking to achieve and then being able to evaluate those decisions based on the overall value. Okay, thank you. Um... Got, uh, we've had some talk about uh, costs and, uh, you know, the fact that green hydrogen is currently more expensive than, than blue at the moment. Uh, I have a question here. Can anyone uh, give any prices or cost forecasts for hydrogen uh, in terms of pence per kilowatt hour or pence per therm? Um, does, does anyone, would anyone be able to sort of provide, give some figures maybe to give a bit more context about uh, how expensive these things are relative to each other? I'll be brave. I've got I've got my hydrogen fact pack in front of me. 
uh, which my okay. team's doing. I'm, I'm, I'm desperately looking for a source, and I can't find it on the slide. But um, the numbers which I've got is these are in pounds per megawatt hour. Um, I, I take the, the fifth amendment. But it's sort of like the numbers that I've got is the grey hydrogen is currently of the order of forty pounds um, a megawatt hour. If you look, I've got twenty fifty numbers for um, blue and green. Um, uh, so I think I think these are Bayes numbers. Right? I'm not sure. Um, and the, the the blue hydrogen number I've got is is blue coming down to around forty pounds a megawatt hour. But if you take account of the carbon cost of the life cycle emissions, then you're more like between forty five and sixty pounds a megawatt hour. And and then green. Um, I've got here at, at um, um, 70 pounds a megawatt hour, um, a, a tiny bit higher if you take account of life cycle emissions. Um, um, now, of course, what really matters then is, is what price you've assumed for electricity, and I can't see it on my page. Um, um, but anyway, there's some numbers um, which I hope are all right. And that, 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 that 70 pound figure for green, that's for expecting for that's forecast for 2050. Is that, yeah, is that that's right? right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. I suppose as well, the other thing will be uh, if there will be a price for, for carbon at that point, and will that be factored in as well? So, um, well, but, it, what it, it does say that there's a, a price assumed of 200 pounds a ton, so that makes me think these are base numbers because there we yeah. go. Okay, great. Uh, I hope, for, hope that's helpful, uh, for people listening. Um, I'd like to go uh, to Helen now. Uh, and so obviously you've been looking at uh, hydrogen homes and that, that may be for a lot of people who uh, perhaps don't work in, in industry, it's something a bit more tangible in terms of where hydrogen will impact their lives. Do you have any sense of um, how uh, potential consumers feel about having hydrogen in the home? Is there any kind of awareness of it at the moment? Uh, and are people worried about um, uh, any particular safety issues or have you is that is that now to come now that we know that um it looks like using hydrogen for appliances is is, is safe and is feasible and um, so we've done some limited focus group research as part of high for heat um where we spoke to you know consumers about how did they feel about these things it was more about what would motivate them to take part in a consumer trial um, with that kind of particular focus in mind, because we see the next thing that has to be done is a trial. You know, you would you would do, want to do trials absolutely before starting to talk about rollouts. Um, so we we did some talking through that. There's some interesting views expressed. Um, the reports out already. I've I've given and just given somebody a link in the Q and A to it. Um, people were in those focus groups were relatively open to the idea. Um, I believe there's been some other um, consumer acceptability work fairly recently done by one of the gas networks um, as well. If people are interested in digging around, they might find something on that. Um, but we're not quite, you know, until people have actually got it and are using it, it's hard to be kind of confident about consumer acceptability. So I would say it's probably something that, you know, needs to keep coming through, but some early work has been done. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and whilst we're on uh, um, sort of hydrogen in the, in the gas network, I have a question, which is, uh, do you have any results on uh, reusing existing pipes and network components for hydrogen use? Uh, and if so, are there going to be guidelines for repurposing these assets? So or is that is, not really your remit? It's not really my remit, I'm afraid, because okay. High for Heat's um, downstream of the, the emergency control valve. The H21 project and others that have been looking at network um, conversion and so on will have will likely have some results on that, though, um, as I say, I've kind of, I'm tangentially aware of, of cast iron um, not being something you want to use with hydrogen, but, um, and I believe there are other kind of materials issues that are being worked through, but there's no point in me comment any further because I don't I don't know much more than that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I know as well that um, certainly in terms of uh, blends of hydrogen and natural gas, the, this, the High Deploy project is looking at that. And um, so if people are interested in how that blend would work in the gas network and in homes, you can go go have a look at that as well. Um, okay, we've got a question uh, for Steve here. Uh, what do you think are the biggest challenges in scaling hydrogen? Is it the production cost or growing uh, the demand for it? Uh, well, of course, the answer is it's both. <laughs> it's, um, 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 
yeah, because one goes with the other. Um, um, you know, if you, if you think what hydrogen has got to replace, it's got to replace um, natural gas. It's got, you know, in some 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 some, some instances, coal, um, yeah, um, petrol. Yeah, so um, there there is a point about um, um, yeah, about the cost be, be becoming economic. Um, but you you also yeah you, you need that virtuous circle of of, the, of demand um, getting the supply chain going and getting the whole of the supply chain going to get the cost reduction going to get the cost down. Um, so I, it feels like a very poor answer really, but it's I, I, you know it, it's this this it, it is getting this 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 virtuous circle and and yeah it sort of links to one of the other questions that was was earlier in the the chat, which is how how on earth do you go about um, uh, making investment decisions? And uh, uh, yeah, so so yeah, for me, in terms of, of of our company trying to make investment decisions, what what we do at a very fundamental level is try and just see where we think the use of hydrogen would bring down the total costs of the the total energy system, and we we, we do some modelling to sort of like do that. And we we leverage also on other people's modelling because then if it does that, then it's got a fighting chance of of of, of having a, a a proper market revenue stream in the future. Um, and um, but in all honesty, to get projects going at the moment is extremely difficult. Um, so as well as you know, ED, EDF has sort of got a little high, um, a little hydrogen subsidiary called Hynamics, which is focused on fairly small scale um, industrial electrolyzers. It's, it's born out of France, so it, the idea is it connect, it would connect to the grid, and you'd put it on your your factory site, and you'd, you'd produce the hydrogen you need at, at, at source. Um, it, it, it's bought a um, electrolyzer manufacturer or, or shares in one, um, but in terms of actually getting projects going, essentially we, we, what we're doing is looking for the nice niches, um, a little bit like Kristen was saying, where, where you find good geography, um, good potential demand infrastructure, and then you're trying to stitch together um, the selection of grants and different revenue streams and opportunistic cost savings and all those sorts of things to try and make something something fly. And, and we're in that territory at the moment. It's um, 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 yeah because the market is not established, it's not mature. Great, thank you. Um, I suppose one area we haven't touched on too much is hydrogen for transport. Um, and, you know, we potentially see hydrogen being used for, for trucks, um, but there's also competition uh, for, for these things from uh, from perhaps biodiesel and, and, um, and other sources. So I'm wondering, Kristen, do, what's your view on uh, hydrogen in the transport sector. Do you think this is an area that's, that's going to grow, or, or do you think the focus is going to remain more on uh, on it in industrial clusters and perhaps um, in the homes for now? Personally, I think as a first step that we need to be focused on industry. Transportation has other solutions, and this this goes back to my menu of of abatement solutions and and. At that that top half, so electrification, direct electrification, can, is is available right now and can be deployed in transportation. Now, if we start looking at shipping and other types of of transportation, that that may be a different story. But looking at transportation, um, uh, vehicle transportation, I think that the story there is going to to be about. Electrification hydrogen trucks is is they're going to have to compete against electric trucks and um, renewable diesel and renewable gas and biogas and I just don't think that it's ready to compete just yet. It's going to be it's going to be it's going to be some time before that. So in the meantime, I'm I'm more about deploy the solutions that are available right now. Okay, um, we're. Coming sort of towards the the end of the Q and A session, uh, there's a few questions that uh, I think along a similar line, which is is really how you know we've talked about how big a challenge this is, and it's kind of asking the panelists how confident do you feel how, how feasible is this really? I think someone even asked for a, a percentage chance, but I won't I won't ask you about that. But um, maybe we could yeah uh, run through through the panelists. I mean for for a bit of context the. Uh, we, we've heard about the ten-point plan in the UK from the from the Prime Minister for a Green Industrial Revolution, and point two in that is to do with low-carbon hydrogen. 
And there's a goal of uh, one gigawatt of hydrogen production capacity by 2025, scaling up to uh, five gigawatts by 2030. Uh, so is that the level of ambition from the UK that you think is uh, is more required? Is Do you think that's kind of what's feasible at the moment? Uh, basically, just this is a kind of a catch-all question of what was your prediction for, for, for the next decade and beyond to 2050? Uh, maybe we'll uh, start with Kristen and we'll go to Stephen Helen afterwards. I gave a few examples of, of projects that are, are underway right now. And, and it's, you know, it's a first step and, and we have to be focused on driving down the cost through scale. And, you know, application at scale, it's, it's, it's not proven yet. So there is a ways to go. And so this is why I keep emphasizing this message about, we have to use all abatement solution, use what is available right now, keep plugging away at trying to drive down the cost. And, and I think that the, the, the step one to do that is really to be focused on replacing gray with green in these existing demand centers. So, um. I think I think we're we're still a ways away from it, but there are there there is a path, there is a very promising path to get there. Great, Steve. What about you? Yes, I I, I feel quite optimistic about it. Um, I I think that at a, when you look at the the the, the route to twenty fifty, um, you know naturally the need for hydrogen comes later rather than sooner. Um, um, the only problem is, is if you leave it until when you really need it, you won't have it. So it's um, so we've got to find these ways of of, of bringing forward um, the development dates. Um, you know, so so um, um, yeah, as Kristen said, that yeah, some of these niche projects that are, that are getting themselves going are really really important. Um, but I'm seeing yeah a, some some reasonable policy momentum. Um, you know, yeah, we've 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 got um, yeah. The hydrogen strategy coming out very soon um, from 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 from, from governments. Um, there's uh, an awful lot of discussion about um, what will be needed to support um, yeah yeah low carbon hydrogen. You know, people are talking about a contract for difference for low carbon hydrogen. Um, um, yeah, uh, and, and and all of the detail around that. So there's a lot of work going on. You know, I lis listened into the. Debate in the House of Lords of all places the other day, um, and you know, um, you know, quite a lot of engagement from quite a lot of, of of different people. And Baroness Bloomfeld rigorously sort of defending where, where, where yeah, and and promoting hydrogen and and talking about reforms to the um, yeah the the, the renewable yeah you know, fuel um, um, yeah benefit that you get from 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 hydrogen and things like that. Um, yeah, yeah, just this. this, this some positivity coming out of, of the EU as well on hydrogen. So, you know, it, it's I, we shouldn't under, underestimate the, um, the, the the challenge, but it's the same challenge we've got for all sorts of things on net zero. And I, I think it pairs to be positive. And Helen, final thoughts from you. Looks like. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry there folks, we go. we've, we've got you back. Yeah. So can hear me no worries. Typing. Um, yeah, I mean, the government's clear on its 10 point plan that it's got, you know, ambitions for hydrogen. Um, it's set out a kind of five gigawatt ambition in partnership. You know, my colleagues in other parts of Bays are certainly working hard to try and um, deliver on that. Um, to, to think about all the flanking actions that will be needed to build up demand ready for supply dream. Um, as Steve said, there's work underway on business models as well. So, you know, I think it, it, it probably is quite important and sensible to make more use of hydrogen in the future. And, and we will probably see considerably more use of it. Um, I can't be drawn on the precise, um, the precise level we might get to, but it's got, it's got a lot of, um, interesting features in terms of being used in the energy mix. So I don't think it's going to, um, you know, not, not expand. I think it's something to pursue. Terrific. Thank you. Um, so that is the end of the Q and a, um, so I'd like to start by, uh, thanking our 3 speakers, Kristen Panarelli, 
Steve Hargreaves and Helen McComb. So we heard from Kristen about um, sort of three key pillars, I think, were uh, the demand centers, uh, a kind of integrated approach, and then moving to, to green hydrogen as the end game. Uh, we heard from Steve uh, about the differences between uh, blue and green hydrogen uh, and how we need a revolution in producing low carbon hydrogen. And I think sounds like certainly for now, we need both. And we also heard from Helen about the High for Heat project and how they're looking at uh, using hydrogen in homes. And we've got lots of uh, exciting work on uh, new appliances there. And I, I, that sounds like there's a lot more work going into looking at making sure hydrogen can come into homes uh, safely. So um, yeah, I hope that um, you all got a lot out of that webinar and uh, hopefully that summarized some of the, the key points for you. So uh, just to, to close, so um, just want to reiterate that uh, this webinar is, as I said, part of the uh, lead up to the Powering Net Zero conference, uh, which will be on the 6th of October online. Uh, and uh, so, again, I would encourage you to, to go take a look on the Energy Institute website uh, about that and to sign up. Uh, I'd also, again, like to thank our sponsors. We have IBM, the EI's knowledge partner, Accenture and EDF Renewables. Now, if you're looking for some, some more uh, hydrogen content, I'm sure you are, uh, the Energy Institute Singapore branch is actually holding another webinar uh, next Tuesday, that's the, the 27th of April. It's at 11 a.m. Uh, UK time, and that is called Hydrogen, Where Are We Now? Uh, Where is the Focus? Uh, it will look at hydrogen from both a European and an Asian perspective, discussing enablers and barriers. Uh, it will feature speakers from NGCO, Nexant, ECA, and the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, uh, once again, uh, you can find out more details about that on the EI website. Uh, so uh, before uh, you all go, uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending today. Uh, we really value any feedback uh, that you provide. So when you close this uh, webinar, there'll be a short feedback survey that will appear in your browser. If you could fill that in, that would be really great. And as I think we mentioned, I think we mentioned to some people in the chat as well, uh, this webinar is being recorded and we'll send a link shortly um, and we'll also send out the, the slide pack. Uh, and uh, I couldn't leave you without asking you to go and look at the EIS Hydrogen Guide and relevant training courses, again, all on our website. Um, that's uh, energyinst.org. Uh, so I'll just thank the speakers again and thank you all for attending. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs>